Now, imagine a stage with an artist performing in front of a crowd. Is there a way to measure and even quantify the show's impact on the spectators? Kai Kunze is going to address this question in his talk, Boiling Minds Now. Kai, up to you. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, we have a short video, I hope, that can be played right now. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So thanks a lot for the intro. And um, this is uh, now the boiling mind talk. So linking physiology and choreography. And um, I just started off with this uh, short uh, video that could give you an overview over the experience of this uh, dance performance that uh, we uh, staged in, in Tokyo uh, beginning of the year, just uh, before the lockdown actually. And the idea behind this was we wanted to put the audience on a stage so breaking the fourth wall, trying to use physiological sensing in the audience 
And that then that change then is reflected on stage over the projection, sound, and also audio to influence the dancers and performers, and then of course feed them back again to the uh, audience. So creating an augmented feedback loop. In this talk today, I just want to give you. Um, small overview a little bit about the motivation why i thought it's a nice topic for uh, the remote experience uh, from the uh, chaos computer club and also a little bit more about the concept the setup and uh, the design iterations as well as the lessons learned so for for me to uh, give this talk um i thought it's a good ex it's a good way to exchange expertise, uh, get a couple of people that might be interested for the next iterations, because I think uh, we are still not done with this work. So it's still kind of work in progress and also a way to share data. So to do some explorative data analysis on the recorded performances that we have. And then most important, I wanted to create a more creative way to use physiological data and explore it because also for me as a researcher working on variable computing or activity recognition often we just look into recognizing or predicting certain motions or certain um, mental states and that kind of at least for um, simple things feeds back into this you know very I think idiotic or um, stupid ideas of uh, surveillance and applications cases in that. So can we create more intuitive ways to use physio physiological data? So from a concept perspective, I think the video gave a good overview or what we tried to create. Uh, however, um, what we did in uh, three performances was we used uh, physiological senses on all audience members. So for us, it was important that we're not singling out individual people to just get feedback from them, but have the whole response, the whole um, physiological state of the audience as an input to the performance. In that case, we actually used uh, heart rate, uh, heart rate variability, and also galvanic skin response as inputs. And uh, these inputs then changed the, the projection that you could see the lights, especially the intensity of the lights, and also the sound. And that again then led uh, to changes in the dancing behavior of the performers. Um, for the sensing, we went with a, a variable setup. Uh, so in this case, uh, a fully uh, wireless uh, wristband, because we wanted to do something that is uh, easy to wear and easy to put on and to put off. We had a couple of iterations on that. Uh, and uh, we decided then for uh, electrodermal activity and also heart activity to sense because uh, there's some related work that link uh, these sensors to engagement, stress and also excitement measures. And uh, the question then was also where to sense it. First, we went with a couple of uh, wristbands and also um, you know, kind of commercial approaches or half commercial approaches. Uh, however, the sensing quality was just not good enough, especially from the wrist. You cannot really get a good uh, um, electrodermal activity, so galvanic skin response. It's more or less a sweat sensor. So that means uh, that you uh, can detect um, just if somebody is uh, sweating and some of the sweat is, is then related to a stress response. And uh, in that case, there are a couple of ways to measure that. So it could be on the lower part of your hand or also on the fingers. These are usually the best positions. So we used the fingers. Over the fingers, we can also get uh, heart rate activity. And uh, in addition to that, uh, there's also a small uh, motion sensor, so a gyro and an accelerometer in the wristband. We haven't used that for the performance right now, but we still have the recordings also from uh, the audience for that.
when I say we, I mean uh, George, especially, and also Ding Ding, two researchers that work with me that actually took care of the designs. So then um, the question was also how to map it to um, the environment or the staging. In this case, actually, um, this was done uh, by a different team. This was done by the embodied media team also at KMD. So I know a little bit about it, but I'm definitely not an expert. Um, and for the initial design, we thought uh, we use um, the EDA for the movement speed of the projection. So the EDA rate of change is um, mapped to movement of uh, these blobs that you could see, or also the meshes uh, that you can see. And the color represents uh, the heart rate. We went for the LFHF feature that's a low frequency, high frequency ratio, and should give you, according to related work some indication about excitement um, for the lights the lights were also bound to the heart rates in this case the beats per minute and they were mapped to intensity so if the beats per minute of the audience go uh, collectively up the light gets brighter otherwise it's dimmer uh, for the audio we had an audio designer that cared about uh, sounds and faded in and faded out specific sounds also um, related to the EDA, to the relative rate of cha change of the um, electrodermal activity. All this uh, happened while the uh, sensors were connected over a sensing server in QT to touch designer uh, software that uh, generated this uh, type of projections and um, also uh, the music got uh, fed into and uh, that was then actually then controlling the feedback to the dancers. If you want to have a bit more of detail, um, I uploaded um, the uh, work in progress pa uh, uh, preprint paper, a draft of an accepted TI paper. So in case you're interested in uh, the, the mappings and the design decisions for the projections, there's a little bit more information there. I'm also happy later on to uh, answer a bit of those questions. However, I will probably just forward them to the designers that worked on them. And then for the overall performance, uh, what happened was um, we started out with an explanation of the experience. So it was already advertised as a performance that would take in electrodermal uh, activity and heart rate activity. So uh, people that uh, bought tickets or uh, came to the event already had a little bit of background information. We, of course, made also sure that we explained at the beginning what type of sensing we we will be using also what uh, the risks and uh, problems with these type of uh, um, sensors and uh, data collection is and then audience could decide uh, with informed consent if they just want to stream the data don't want to do anything or they want to stream and also contribute the data uh, anonymously to our research and then when the performance started we had a couple of uh, pieces and parts, that's something that you can see in B, where we showed the live data feed from all of the audiences in individual tiles. We had that in before just for um, debugging, but actually the audience uh, liked that. And so we made it a part of the performance, uh, also deciding with the choreographers um, to include that. And then for the rest, as you see in C, we have the individual objects, uh, these uh, blob objects that move according to the EDA uh, data and uh, change color based on the heart rate uh, information, so the low to high frequency. In D, you see also these clouds, and here similarly, the size is uh, is um, related to the heart rate data, and the movement again is EDA. And there's also one scene in uh, E where the dancers pick one person in the audience uh, and ask them to come on stage, and then we will display that uh, audience member's uh, data uh, at a large in the back of the projection. And for the rest, again, we're using this uh, excitement data from the heart rate 
and from the um, electrodermal uh, activity to uh, change sizes and colors. So for to come up with this uh, design, uh, we went the uh, co-design route discussing with uh, the uh, researchers, dancers, uh, visual designers, audio designers a couple of times. And actually, that's also how I got involved first, because the initial ideas uh, also from Moe, the uh, primary designer of this piece, uh, were to combine somehow perception and motion and um, I worked uh, a bit in research with uh, eye tracking so uh, you see on the screen the pupil labs eye tracker it's an open source eye tracking solution and also EOG electrooculography uh, electrooculography gr uh, glasses that uh, use uh, the um, capacitance of your eyeballs to detect uh, something rough about eye motion and we thought at the beginning we want to combine this uh, a person seeing the play with the motions of the dancers and understand that better so that's kind of how it started the uh, second inspiration uh, for this um, idea uh, in the theater idea came from a visiting scholar, uh, Jamie, Jamie Ward, uh, came over and his work um, with the Flute Theater in London. That's an inclusive theater that also uh, does workshops or so Shakespeare workshops. And he did some sensing just with the uh, accelerometer and the gyroscope, so inertial motion wristbands uh, to detect interpersonal synchrony between uh, participants in these workshops. And then we thought when he came over, we had a small piece where we looked into um, this interpersonal synchrony again in face-to-face -face communications. I mean, now we are remote and I'm just talking into a camera and I cannot see anybody. But usually if you would have a face-to-face -face conversation, doesn't happen too often uh, um, anymore, unfortunately, uh, we would show some type of synchrony. So, you know, kind of uh, eye blink, uh, head nod and so on would synchronize with the other person if you're talking to them. And we also showed that in uh, small recordings. Also, we showed that we, that we can recognize this in uh, a variable sensing setup. So again, using uh, some glasses. And we thought, hmm, why don't we try to scale that up? Why don't we try and see what happens in a theater performance or in another dance performance and see if we can recognize also some type of synchrony? And uh, with a couple of ideation sessions, a couple of uh, also test performances, also uh, including um, uh, dancers trying out uh, um, glasses, trying out other headwear, and that was not really possible to use uh, for the dancers uh, during the performance, we came up with an initial prototype and that we tried out. So in, I think, November 2018 or so on. Um, where we used a couple of pupil labs and also pupil invisible. These are nicer eye tracking glasses. They are optical eye tracking glasses, so they have small cameras in them uh, distributed in the audience. A couple of those EOG glasses. Uh, they have also inertial motion sensors in them, so accelerometer and gyroscope. And we had at the time uh, heart rate sensors. However, they were uh, fixed and wired. Um, to the system and also the dancers wore some wristbands uh, where we can could record the motion data. And then what we did in this case is then we had uh, projections on uh, three frames on top of the dancers. One was showing uh, the blink and the head nod synchronization of the audience. The other one uh, showed heart rate and variability. And the third one just showed raw feed from uh, one of the eye trackers. And it looked more or less like this. And from a technical perspective, we were surprised because it actually worked. So we could stream around uh, 10 glasses, uh, three eye trackers, and uh, four or five, five, I think, uh, uh, heart rate uh, sensors at the same time. And the server worked. However, from um, 
from an audience perspective, a lot of the feedback was the, the audience didn't like that just some people got singled out and got the device uh, by themselves and others could not really contribute and could not also see the data. And then also from a performance perspective, um, the dancers didn't really like that they couldn't interact with the data. The dance piece also in this case was pre-choreographed, so um, there was no possibility for uh, the dancers to really interact with the data. And then also, again, from uh, an aesthetic perspective, we really didn't like that the screens were on top because either you would concentrate on the screens or you would on concentrate on the dance performance and you had to kind of make a decision also on what type of visualization you would focus on. So overall, you know, kind of partly okay, but still there were some some troubles. So one was definitely we wanted to include all of the audience, meaning uh, we wanted to have everybody participate. Uh, then the a problem with that part was then also, you know, having enough eye trackers or having enough uh, uh, head-worn devices was an issue in addition to that, you know, kind of if it's head-worn, some people might not like it. The pandemic hadn't started yet when we did the recordings. However, there was already uh, the uh, information, some information about a virus going around. So we didn't really want as uh, uh, putting, you know, everybody, uh, giving everybody some eyeglasses. So then uh, we moved to the heart rate and uh, um, galvanic skin response solution and uh, the setup where the projection is now part of the stage. So we use the two walls, but we also use, it's a little bit hard to see in the images, but we also used the floor as a um, not a projection surface for the dancers to interact with. And the main interaction actually came then over the sound. So then moving over um, to the lessons learned. So uh, what did we take away from, from that experience? And um, the first uh, part was um, talking with... Uh, uh, dancers and talking with uh, the audience often if you saw especially the more intricate the more abstract the visualizations it was sometimes hard to interpret also how the own data would uh, feed into that uh, visualization so you know kind of some audience members mentioned to some point in time they were not sure if they're influencing anything or if uh, it had an effect uh, on other parts especially if they saw the live data, it was kind of obvious. But for future work, we really want to play more with the agency and also perceived agency of the audiences and the performers. And uh, we also really wonder how can we measure these type of feedback loops? Because now we have these recordings. We looked also a little bit more into the data, but it's hard to understand where we successful I think in some extent, maybe yes, because the experience was uh, fun, it was enjoyable. Uh, but on this level of uh, did we really create feedback loops and how to evaluate feedback loops, that's something that uh, we want to address in future work. On the other hand, uh, what was surprising, I mentioned before, uh, the raw data was something that the dancers as well as the audience really liked and that was surprising for me because i thought we had to hide that more or less but we had it on as i said as kind of a debug at the beginning of some test screenings and the audience members were interested in it and could see and were talking about oh see your heart rate is going up or your eda is going up and the dance us also like that and we used that then in the performance in the three performances that we uh, then uh, successfully um, made 
uh, for especially scenes where the dancers would interact directly with parts of the audience. At the beginning of the play is a scene where the dancers give out um, business cards to uh, some audience members. And it was fun to see that uh, uh, some audience members could identify themselves or the audience members would identify uh, somebody else uh, that was sitting next to them. And then this member had a, a spike in EDA because of the surprise. So there was really you know, kind of some interaction going on. So maybe staying, if you're planning to do a similar event, staying close to the raw data and also uh, low latency is, I think, uh, quite important for some types of these interactions. Uh, from the dancers, there was a uh, big interest. Uh, one On the one side, they wanted to use the data for um, reflection. So they really liked that they had the printouts of the effects of the audience later on. However, they also uh, wanted to dance more with biometric data and also use that for their rehearsals more. So of course, you know, we had the co-design, so we worked directly, we showed the, the dancers, uh, the sensors and the possibilities and then worked with them to figure out what can work and what cannot work and uh, what might have an effect, what might not have an effect. And then we did some, as you saw, also some prototype screenings and also some uh, internal uh, rehearsals where we used some recorded data, we used uh, some, a uh, couple of people of us were sitting in the audience, we got a couple of uh, other researchers and also students involved to sit in the audience to uh, stream data and then we also worked a little bit with uh, pre-recorded experiences and also synthetic um, experiences how we envisioned that the data would move but still it was not enough in terms of uh, providing an intuitive way to understand what is going on especially also for the visualizations and the projections they were harder to interpret than the uh, sound and the sound sphere so and then the, the next and the, the biggest point uh, maybe as well is um, the sensors and the feature best practices. So we're still wondering, you know, what to use. We're still searching what kind of uh, sensing equipment can we use to relay this, in, this invisible link between audience and performers and how can we augment that? We started out with the uh, perception and eye tracking parts. Uh, we then went to a wrist one device because it's easier to maintain and it's also wireless and it worked quite well to stream 50 um, to 60 audience members uh, for one of those events uh, to uh, a wireless router and do the uh, recording as well as the, the live uh, visualization with it. However, uh, the features might have not been
Okay, yeah, sorry for the uh, uh, short part where I was offline. Uh, so um, we were talking about the sensor features and best practices. So in this case, we are still searching for the right type of um, uh, sensors and features to use for uh, this type of um, uh, audience performer interaction. And uh, we were using the um, um, yeah, uh, low frequency, high frequency ratio of the heart rate values and also the relative changes of the EDA. And that was working, I would say, not that well uh, compared to other features that we now found while looking into the performances and the recorded data of the around uh, 98 participants that uh, uh, agreed to share the data with us um, for these performances. And from the preliminary analysis that something uh, Karen Han, uh, one of uh, our researchers working on and looking into, you know, kind of what type of features are indicative of changes in the um, a performance, it seems that uh, a feature called PNN that's related to heart rate variability to the RR intervals is uh, uh, seems to be quite good. And also the peak detection per minute using the EDA data. So we're just counting the relative changes, the relative up and down uh, for the EDA. Um, if you are interested, uh, I'm happy to share the data uh, with you. So, so we have three performances, each around an hour and 98 per participants in total. And we have uh, the heart rate data, the uh, EDA data uh, from the two fingers, as well as uh, the um, motion data as well. We haven't used the motion data at all, except for filtering out a little bit the um, EDA and heart rate data, because, you know, if you're moving a lot, uh, you will have uh, some errors and some uh, problems, uh, some motion artifacts in it. But what do I mean with uh, why is the PNN or why is the EDA um, uh, peak uh, detection so nice. Uh, let's look a little bit closer into the data. And here you see, uh, I just uh, highlighted performance three from the previous plots. You see PNN uh, 50 on the left side is the, um, um, uh, the um, scale. Uh, the blue line gives you the average of the um, PNN 50 value. Uh, so this is the uh, RR interval. Uh, related uh, heart rate variability feature. And that feature is especially related to relaxation and also to stress. So usually a lower PNN value, PNN 50 value means you're more relaxed and a higher value means you are, uh, no, a higher value means that you are uh, more relaxed, sorry. Uh, lower value means that you are more stressed out. So what happens now in the performance is something that fits very, very well and correlates with the intention of the, of the choreographer. Because the first half of the performance, so, so you see section one, two, three, four, uh, five, and uh, six um, on the bottom, the first half of the performance is to create a conflict in the uh, audience and to stir them up a little. So for example, also the business card scene is part of that part or also the scene where uh, somebody gets uh, brought from the audience to the stage and uh, joins the performance is also part of that. Versus the la latter part is more about reflection and also relaxation. So taking in what you experienced at the first part. And that's something that you see actually quite nice in the PN and so at the beginning, it's rather low. That means the audience is uh, slightly tense uh, versus in the latter part, uh, they are more relaxed. Uh, similarly, the EDA in the bottom as a bar chart gives you an indication of uh, uh, a lot of peaks happening at specific points. And these points correlate very well to memorable scenes in the performance. So uh, seeing the one scene where actually section four, the red one is the one where somebody from the audience gets brought onto the stage uh, versus I think around 
minute 12 uh, there's the, a scene where the um, uh, dancers uh, hand out the uh, business cards and uh, that's also something i think so it's promising we are not there yet definitely from the data analysis uh, part but there are some interesting uh, things to see and uh, that kind of brings me back to the starting point so i think um it was uh, an amazing experience actually working with a lot of uh, talented people on that and the uh, performance was a lot of fun, but we are slowly moving towards putting the audience on stage and trying to break uh, the fourth wall, I think, with these type of setups. And that leads me then also to the end of the talk. Um, where I just uh, uh, have to do a shout out for the people who did the actual work. So all of uh, the uh, talented performers and uh, the project lead, especially so Moe, uh, who organized and was also the link between the artistic uh, side and uh, the dancers with Mademoiselle Cinema and us, uh, as well as the choreographer uh, Ito-san. Uh, and um, yeah, I hope I didn't uh, miss anybody. Uh, so that's it. So thanks a lot uh, for uh, yeah, this opportunity to uh, introduce um, this work to you. And now I'm open for a couple of questions, uh, remarks. Um, I wanted to also host a self-organized session sometime. I haven't really gotten a link or anything, but uh, I'll probably just uh, uh, post something on Twitter or in one of the chats. If you want uh, to stay in contact, uh, I'll try to get um, two or three researchers also to join. I know George, who was working on the hardware, and uh, Karen, uh, who worked on the visualizations uh, on the uh, data analysis, might be available. Um, and if you're interested in that, just uh, send me an email or uh, check. Uh, m maybe I just also add it to the blog post or so on if, they get, uh, if I get the link later. So, yeah, thanks a lot for the attention. Thanks, Kai, for this nice talk. <laughs> um, for the audience, uh, please uh, excuse us for the small disruption of service we had here. Um, we're a little bit late already, but I think we still have time for a question or so. Unfortunately, I don't see anything here online at the moment. So if somebody tried to pose a question and there was also a disruption of service, I apologize beforehand for that. On the other hand, now Kai, you talked about data sharing. So how can the data be accessed? To People need to access you or to drop your mail, personal message. Yeah, we are, we are on the. Um, so uh, right now, also the um, no publication is still accepted, and there's also some issues, actually a little bit uh, of uh, some rights issues or so on. So mm -hmm. the easiest part is just to send me a mail. Uh, it will be posted sometime next year um, on uh, also on public uh, on a more public website but uh, the easiest is just to post me a mail there are already a couple of uh, people working on it and we have uh, the the rights to share it it's just a little bit of a question of uh, setting it up i wanted to have the website also online before the talk but yeah as with the technical difficulties and so on everything is a little bit harder this year Indeed, indeed. <laughs> Thanks, Kai. Um, yes, I would say that's it for this session. Thank you very much again for your presentation. And I'll switch back to the others.